This video is going to help get you through the cell structure and function lab. It starts on page 39 in the lab manual, unless they have moved it around in the newer version of the lab manual. Um, it starts out by just giving you what are your objectives that you're supposed to learn during the process of this course. And then on the next page, uh, it starts to talk about the different kinds of cells that are present. And we're going to cover this stuff in lecture as well. But for lab purposes, you do also need to know that there's prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are much, much, much smaller than eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells don't have nuclei inside of them. They don't have any membrane-bound structures. That means they don't have any rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi apparatus. They won't have chloroplasts or mitochondria. They do still have ribosomes inside of them, and they have cytoplasm, and they have DNA. They just don't put membranes around those structures to protect them, um, and that's mostly because those cells are so small, they really just don't have room for any of those things. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, are much larger. They do have membrane-bound structures inside of them, including the visible nucleus. Um, there's other structures that are in here that a standard light microscope can't see without special stains present. Um, and that, again, is the rough ER, the smooth ER, the Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, those sorts of things. But the nucleus usually stains with any kind of stain that you use, and so you would be able to see that present inside of the cell. Um, prokaryotic cells did evolve first based on the fossil record. Eukaryotic cells came around about a billion years after prokaryotes had been on the planet already. Um, after that, when we're in face-to-face -face lab, we usually do a cheek smear so you can see some of your own cells, which you are eukaryotic. This is what your cells look like when you stain them with methylene blue, so you can see the nuclei present inside the cells. One of the reasons that I like to show this particular picture is you can really see the size difference between prokaryotic cells, these things they have labeled as bacteria on this picture, and the eukaryotic cell, which this is one big eukaryotic cell, so that size difference is very visible on this picture. But this is a eukaryotic cell. It also happens to be an animal cell because whether you want to believe it or not, you are an animal. Um, after that, we usually do a plant cell preparation. Um, the plant cells have visible chloroplasts in them, even without stain. There are nuclei present, but we don't usually stain this slide, so you can't see the nucleus as well. Um, it's, you just can't see it without adding some contrast to it, but those chloroplasts are really visible. So plant cells are eukaryotic, and they're plant cells. Um, after that, on pages 42 and 43, you guys have a little chart or table that starts to list the functions of the organelles and cell structures that are present. Um, I recommend that you do make some flashcards where you put like plasma membrane on one side and then you put protects the cell or semi-permeable and then a picture of what it looks like on the other. That can really help you study these things as you go through here. So study that. Um, on the next couple of pages, you have pictures of animal cells and plant cells. Instead of using those to teach you, because you already have that labeled, I'm going to show you the models that we would ordinarily show you while we were in the face-to-face -face class. And we're going to go ahead and label the parts. So this is a eukaryotic cell. You can tell because there's a bunch of membrane-bound structures. Um, there's a nucleus right there that's nice and visible. It's also an animal cell. There's lots of reasons why you would be able to tell that it's an animal cell. Um, it doesn't have chloroplasts present. It doesn't have a cell wall around it. It just has the plasma membrane. And that's actually gonna be the first thing we're gonna label on this. So that light blue coating out there, that's the plasma membrane. I'm gonna abbreviate because I super suck at writing on my computer screen. And of course it took away my little arrow. So that is the plasma membrane. No cell wall outside of that. That's how you know that it, this is an animal cell. Next, this golf ball looking thing inside the middle. That is what ideally makes this a eukaryotic cell. That's the nucleus. Most animal cells are just going to have one of those, but there are cells even in you that have more than one nucleus present inside of them. Outside of the nucleus, you have all of this blue tubing that has these little white dots on them. The little white dots are ribosomes. Ribosomes function in protein synthesis. They carry out a step that's called translation. They read messenger RNA and then build proteins out of that. The blue stuff that has the ribosomes on the surface, that's called rough ER. The ER stands for endoplasmic reticulum. This makes proteins and then folds them into the specific shape that they're supposed to have. Now, one of the things that stinks about this model is it doesn't really show smooth ER like it's supposed to. 
Smooth ER is not flat like rough ER is. Instead, it ends up being more tubular and it doesn't have the ribosomes on the surface. Since this is the only part on this model that doesn't have ribosomes on the surface, this is what I'm going to go ahead and label as the smooth ER in my really horrible screenwriting handwriting. Um, it helps with making lipids. In some cells, it stores calcium. It does slightly different things in different types of cells. Um, this is not what this organelle looks like in newer models. In fact, don't make it look like this stock structure at all, at all. But this is the Golgi apparatus. It's also sometimes called the Golgi complex. This is sort of like the post office of the cell. It'll take the proteins that were made by the rough ER and package it up in these little bubbles that are called vesicles and then send them to wherever they're supposed to go. So a vesicle is really just a packing bubble that takes things around inside the cell. This whole black structure right here is called a centrosome. It is going to help to control the spindle um, during mitosis. In an animal cell, there are these little structures that appear yellow on this model. They're called centrioles. Come on, you can do a pin. There we go. Um, this is one of the other differences between animal cells and plant cells. Animal cells have centrioles in the centrosome, plant cells do not. And so if you can see those, then you know you've got to be looking at an animal cell. Um, these little orange structures, they've cut through it here, and on this one, you're just seeing the outside of it. That is a mitochondria. It's the one thing that everybody always remembers from high school. I don't know why they drill this one in. Um, the singular form of mitochondria is mitochondrion. And since I only labeled one right there, I'm going to go ahead and write mitochondrion. Um, they have those little shelves that are inside of them that help to increase surface area. Next up, we've got these other little bubbles that are floating around. Animal cells have a couple of different bubbles that can be present, which this model tried to color code them for you guys. But unless you know what's inside the bubble, you don't actually know what the bubble's function is. So we're going to say that this bubble uh, contains digestive enzymes. That would make it a lysosome. It helps eat up cellular components that aren't doing their job anymore. That's called autophagy when that happens. It can also, especially in white blood cells that are supposed to run around and eat pathogens, once the pathogen gets into the cell, we need to digest that so it doesn't hurt the cell itself. And so it will merge with the lysosome so that we can digest the bacteria or whatever that that white blood cell just ate. Now, I'm trying to see if I can find one that I didn't kind of label my way out of, but this one right here, it's a bubble that contains enzymes that can make superoxides, like hydrogen peroxide. It's called a peroxisome. It plays a role in detoxifying substances, and that plays a role in immunity as well. It can help carry out this process that's called the respiratory burst, where essentially you just dump free radicals on pathogens to try to destroy them. So it plays a role in immunity. Those are the parts that you need to make sure you can recognize in an animal cell. Another little thing that I usually mention as we're talking about this stuff, the fluid inside the cell, this stuff right here, the fluid by itself is called cytosol. A lot of people come out of high school believing it's called cytoplasm, but the cytoplasm is technically everything inside the cell, including all of those organelles. So essentially, cytoplasm is cytosol plus the organelles or the chunky bits that we just labeled on that picture. So spend a little bit of time Googling a couple of different pictures of cells. You can find a bazillion of them out there. Make sure you would recognize those organelles and then make sure you know what the function of those organelles is supposed to be. Also make sure if I were to show you this picture, you would be able to tell me that's a eukaryotic cell because it has membrane bound organelles and it's an animal cell because there's no cell wall. It has lysosomes and it has centrioles in it. Next up, the plant model. Um, looks a little bit like this right here, and I'm sorry this picture is a little bit blurrier this time around. Most of the organelles look the same in a plant cell as they did in an animal cell, so this is still a nucleus. Um, this is still rough ER. This is still the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus. These little orange guys are still mitochondria. Um, the blue that doesn't have the white dots on it, that's still smooth ER. But from there, oh yeah, I should also go ahead and label it. It's yellow on this model instead, but that's the plasma membrane. So plant cells do still have a plasma membrane. But outside of that, they have something that the animal cell did not have. So this sort of greeny layer that starts right there and kind of continues out, go away. Um, that is the cell wall. 
It helps to maintain rigidity so that plants can stand up because they don't have a skeleton. So they need something to help them stand up against gravity and that cell wall is what helps to make those cells what's known as turgid. So water pressure plus that firmness of the cell wall can help plants actually stand upright. Um, next, these green things, which there's one that's cut open. Here's one that's not. Those are chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contain the chlorophyll that helps to absorb light so the plant can carry out photosynthesis. Plants very often also have this structure right here. It's called the central vacuole because it's in the middle of the cell. A uh, vacuole is a place where we can store excess water, excess pigments, excess uh, chemicals. So the plant's storing a bunch of stuff inside of that bubble. When plants start to wilt because they haven't been watered recently, the reason that they wilt is that central vacuole loses a lot of the water, and so it makes the contents inside the cell shrivel. Um, that's called plasmolysis in an animal cell um, or crenation sometimes. Um, so that's what's going on whenever a plant starts to wilt, essentially. Let's see, did I forget anything on this one? It's either too blurry or I just can't see it, but I can't say I see a centrosome on this model. Um, plants do have a centrosome, they just don't have centrioles inside of it. They do still have ribosomes, little white dots, I don't know, I can see them the best right around the nucleus right there. So those are still the ribosomes which still carry out protein synthesis. So that's the plant stuff that you have going on. Um, once again, if you were to see this picture, you would hopefully be able to tell me that it's a eukaryotic cell because we have a nucleus. Um, you should be able to tell me it's a plant cell because it has chloroplasts and it has a cell wall. And so that's your standard plant cell and what's going on inside of the plant cell. From there, there's a few other kinds of cells that we usually show students. And so these are microscope pictures or what's known as a micrograph of various other organisms that are not plants or animals, but they're still made out of cells. Um, on page 46, you should have an area to label some of these pictures, and so mixed protozoa is what you have first. We've got some little things that are called paramecia swimming around, we've got amoebas swimming around, and then we have something called volvox. I'm going to focus on the amoeba because it shows my point better than some of the other cells that we have on here. This one big giant gloppy thing, which I'm going to recommend you doodle in that little circle that they've given you in the lab manual, this is one cell. There's the nucleus for that cell. The fact that it has a nucleus tells you this is eukaryotic, but it's a single-celled organism. It's not multi-celled like plants and animals. The cells in an amoeba tend to be a little bit more animal-like than they do plant-like. It doesn't have a cell wall. It doesn't have chloroplasts. Um, so a little bit more on the animal side for this particular one, but Volvox that's off over here on this side, it's a protist that's a little bit more plant-like than it is animal-like. So sometimes you can get Cells that aren't plant or animal, they're sort of in between those and they're different. And so this is your example of cells that are eukaryotic, but they're not plant or animal. Next up, we have penicillium. Well, if you know the kingdoms from high school, you know there's a plant kingdom, an animal kingdom, and there's a fungi kingdom. Um, penicillium is in that fungi kingdom. It's still eukaryotic, the cells still have a nucleus. This time though, for the organism, the organism ends up being built out of all these threads. You can see one of the threads that starts back off the slide and you can't see it and it extends down. And then it branches into these spore forming structures. Now I have always recognized penicillium because to me this looks like a weird creepy skeletal hand that's reaching out for something. So every time I saw a creepy hand under the microscope I automatically twigged to this is penicillium. Penicillium is the fungus that produces the antibiotic penicillin. So this is eukaryotic, but again, not plant or animal. This one is a fungal type of cell, which again is sort of like a cross between a plant and an animal. It has a cell wall that's more plant-like, but it doesn't have a chloroplast and it does have lysosomes to help it digest things. So it's kind of a cross between the two. Rhizopus, now notice very thready. Thready means fungus, and so this is another one that would be in the kingdom fungi. It does have eukaryotic cells. Instead of the deathly skeletal fingers that penicillium had, this one's just got a ball with a nice little Bob Ross afro coming off the top of it right there, and so it's a happy little fungus. This is common black bread mold, but rhizopus is just another example of a fungus, so eukaryotic, 
not plant or animal, fungus. Next, Anabina. This one is blown up way more. I kind of wish on the pictures that I pulled this from, they would have told me the magnification, but this is probably more oil immersion lens. Um, each one of these little balls is its own cell. And as you look at it, hopefully you can tell there is no nucleus inside of those cells. So Anabina is an example of a prokaryotic organism that is kind of plant-like because it does have chlorophyll present inside the cells and it is capable of photosynthesis. But this is just kind of doodle a bunch of little balls held together in a chain and then that's what Anabina is supposed to look like. And then make a note, this is an example of a prokaryotic organism, no nucleus present inside those cells. Now, Anabina is a type of bacterium. Bacteria can come in several different shapes. The only shapes that they are going to hold you responsible for are caucus, which is spherical shaped. Your example of that is these little guys right here. What's happening in this picture is you're getting balls, but they're being held together in little chunks of four. It's called a tetrad when that happens. And so each one of those tetrads consists of four caucus shaped cells and so round or spherical that's what caucus is um, the next shape that you guys are going to be held responsible for is bacillus bacillus is column shaped or rectangular or rod shaped or whichever one you want to call it these little guys up over here like there's a rod there's a rod there's a rod so there's a bunch of them on that slide that one happens to be bacillus anthracis which is the causative agent of anthrax it's a bacterial species and it is rod shaped the last one that they are holding you responsible for is the corkscrew shape, which is called spirilla or spirillum is singular. And so that's, of course, this wavy looking guy off over here. So if it's not a ball and it's not a rod and it looks like a worm swimming around, but it's not, um, it, it's not made of cells that have a nucleus, these are all examples of prokaryotic organisms. They just come in these different shapes. And so notice, again, in every single one of these cells, there's not a nucleus. Now, one of the things that can sometimes confuse some students, especially as they're looking at the anthrax up over here, sometimes students want to look at that little structure right there and call it a nucleus, but this is actually a spore former and it's in the process of forming a spore. And so those aren't nuclei. Look at the other cells and you can tell there's no nucleus present on any of the cells that are up here. So these are all prokaryotic. They just have different shapes going on to them. After that, you get to the questions that start on page 47 of your lab manual. First up, you have matching questions. You can find the answers to those in that chart earlier that started on page 42 and 43. But let's see, I'll kind of look over this with you and make sure we get it. For smoothie R, that's going to be lipid synthesis and metabolism, so I. Golgi apparatus is going to package proteins, so C. Ribosomes is the site of protein synthesis, so B. Nucleus contains most of the DNA, so D. Centrioles, controls to spindle, does it say anything about store, transport, site of, stores, digest, contains, packages, site. I don't really see the function of those. Movement, I guess, is going to be the best option for the centrioles because the centrioles control the spindle and the spindle helps control the flagella and the cilia, so H is what I would put for centrioles there. Mitochondria, of course, powerhouse. Powerhouse, all your cells run off the power of ATP, so A is the right answer. Chloroplasts do photosynthesis, and so G, cytophotosynthesis. Lysosome is about digestion, so E as an echo. Rough ER helps to fold proteins, make proteins. Um, I don't really like store and transport proteins because we kind of said that for Golgi apparatus. So let's say, well, Golgi is, okay, so here's what I want to talk about as we look at those two answers. A lot of organelles have some overlap between what they're going to do. Rough ER has all of those ribosomes on the surface, and the ribosomes help to make what's known as the primary structure of a protein, and then the Rough ER helps to fold it into the correct secondary and tertiary structure. From there, the Rough ER packages the proteins into little vesicles and ships them off to the Golgi apparatus. And so the rough ER is folding proteins, making proteins, and then sending them over to the Golgi. So I guess you could say it packages proteins. And then for Golgi apparatus, go more for the store and transport proteins for J. Um, vacuole stores waste and water, so F. 
For eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, differentiate their structures. Just remember, eukaryotes have way more structures. Prokaryotes really just have ribosomes, cytosol, DNA. Give examples of other eukaryotic cells, plant cells, animal cells, fungal cells, protist cells. Give examples of other prokaryotic cells. Um, that would be bacterial cells or archaeal cells. That would be those different shapes like Coccus bacillus spirilla that you can see up here. Anabina was an example of a bacterial cell. Explain the function of the following. Plasma membrane helps to protect the cell by being semi-permeable. Some things can get in, some things can't. So it tries to prevent bad things from entering the cell. It does a lot more than that too, but that's a good highlight for plasma membrane. Cytoplasm is where all the reactions take place. Remember, the cytoplasm is the cytosol plus all the organelles, so it's where everything happens. It's where the work of the cell actually happens. List the differences between animal cells and plant cells. So I kind of did this as we went through the whole video, but animal cells don't have a cell wall. They don't have chloroplasts, but they do have lysosomes. Um, they do have centrioles. Plant cells do have a cell wall and chloroplasts, but they don't have centrioles and lysosomes. Um, oh, and that's all the questions for that chapter. So hopefully that helps get you through the lab on cell structure and function. You can also go back and watch the video for lecture, and that should be able to help you out with this as well.